This morning we are going to continue our walk through the book of Acts. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 21 today. Uh, We're going to be reading in verses 15 through 26. Acts chapter 21 verses 15 through 26. In the scripture this morning that we're going to be looking at, Paul and his mission team were on the last leg of their missionary journey, their last, uh, the last leg of their third journey that we've looked at, and they've arrived at Jerusalem. If you remember, last week we were talking about uh, the fact that people were warning Paul not to go, and he went anyway against what people, wise counsel had told him to do. And John Phillips, commentary writer, explained that it was about 65 miles from where they started in Caesarea to Jerusalem. Now that was by road, not the way the crow flies. Yesterday, Amy and I were getting ready to go to Birmingham. And she plugged something in on the GPS, and it said that we were X number of miles away. And I said, okay, now hit directions. And I think it said that we were like 16 miles away. And then you hit directions, and that number quickly changes because you're no longer going the way the crow flies, as the old term says. But now you're going by road, and that journey is longer. And so this journey that they have taken is about 65 miles by road from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Some of the Christians from Caesarea decided to come along. They said, well, we couldn't talk Paul out of going, so we might as well just go with him uh, and encourage him on his journey. They knew uh, of someone in Jerusalem with whom the others could stay, and so they felt like they had a place to go, and so they decided to go. Paul was about to enter a period of trial and tribulation, uh, and over the next few weeks, as we finish the book of Acts, we'll see that The rest of Paul's journey here uh, in Acts, he becomes a prisoner and stays a prisoner of Rome. But this morning, I want us to explore what happened when Paul first arrived in Jerusalem. So if you've opened your Bibles to Acts chapter 21, we'll begin reading in verse 15. And the, the, the word of the Lord says, After these days we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Remember they had been in Caesarea and We're preparing to go to Jerusalem. After these days, we got up and got ready and went to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they had heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brothers, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Verse 23, Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. Verse 26, Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them, and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the boldness of Paul to go even to the places where he knew he was going to experience trial and tribulation. Lord, I thank you for those people who serve across our globe. God, who go even knowing they're going to experience trial and tribulation. God, specifically, again, this morning for those in Afghanistan, God, who are God who are fighting for their life. 
because of their trust and faith in you, God. Lord, protect them. God, give them boldness to stand in all circumstances. For it's in your gracious and loving heavenly name we pray today. Amen. Do you ever need help in life? Do you ever need help in life? I know I do sometimes. Uh, we, there, are, there are many instances that come along during the week where I need help. Uh, I call on different people in the office to help me with different things. I don't know how to do some things, uh, and so I call on them. If I don't feel well, I need help. I need to go to my doctor. If my power goes off, I need help. I need the power company to come turn it back on. If we are honest with ourselves, there are some point in life when we all need help. Thanks be to God that there are people around who are able to help in almost every circumstance. But friends, the flip side of that this morning that I want us to see is that God wants us to be helpers as well. He doesn't just want us to rely on the help of other people, but instead God wants us to help others as well. So this morning, from this passage of Scripture, I want us to see four things that I believe God shows us that we can do to help the church. And first that we'll start this morning is we can help with hospitality in our hearts. One of the ways that we can help the church is hospitality, having hospitality in our hearts. When we think about church, we think about it being a hospitable place. Now, let me tell you, I have visited churches that were not so hospitable, uh, but thank the Lord that you guys are, and we serve uh, in a great place where you are hospitable. We can help God's church with the kind of uh, hospitality I'm almost going to say hostility, but we're not going to be hostile. We're going to be hospitable instead of hostile. But if we look at the verse in the word in verses 15 through 17, we see the the report of hospitality that Luke gives here. It says, After these days we got ready and went up to Jerusalem, and some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. We see a sense of hospitality here. We see a sense of people excited to see other believers. They were excited to bring them in and do whatever they could to help. You see, Paul and his mission team were almost to Jerusalem when they got here. But where would they stay when they got there? John Phillips, a commentary writer, said that out, that, uh, out there, there weren't a lot of places for them to stay, even among the Christians in Jerusalem. The reason why was because Paul had brought Gentile believers with him, and they knew that there was going to be persecution. People were not willing to bring them into their home. You see, remember when Peter went into Cornelius' house back several months ago when we were in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius was a Roman centurion. And the first thing that Peter said was this, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one another of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. You see, these people knew that they would be looked down upon, that they would be considered to be lawbreakers if they showed hospitality to these Jews allowing Gentiles into their homes was not specifically forbidden at this time by the law given by Moses, but the scribes and the Pharisees added layer upon layer upon layer to God's law, and by the traditions of the elders, allowing a Gentile into your home was very criminal. It was something that was very much looked down upon. But there was a kind-hearted Christian who had a home in Jerusalem, and his name was Manasseh. And the KJV says that he was an old disciple. It refers to him as an old disciple, and he probably was old. But the main idea here that I want us to get is that he had been one of the first believers. He might have even been one of the original 70 that Jesus sent out in Luke chapter 10. But friends, what I want us to see is his willingness to bring these people in, even though they were not like him, even though they were Gentile. Do you know that those Gentiles loved listening to his stories? They went into his home and he was able to share stories with them about the earliest church. 
They were able to share stories about things that had happened early on in the ministry. And I want to thank God for people like Manasseh who are willing to open their hearts and who are willing to open their homes, even to people that they don't know. And I get to thinking about my time in ministry and the time that I've been able to sit down in people's homes and hear about things that have happened not only at Mount Pisgah over the years, the way that God has moved and worked and the way that He's blessed this church, but other places that I've served as well. People who show that hospitality, who welcome them in. And I think that this is why it is so important that we push for a cross-generational ministry. We need each other. It doesn't matter if I'm 30 and you're 80. I need your stories. I need your wisdom. We need to learn from one another. We need to be hospitable with one another. And we may have a place for people to stay, but we, we might not have a place for people to stay, but God can still fill our hearts with gracious hospitality. Thank God for people like Manasseh who are willing to open. But friends, even if you can't open your home, you can show up and you can do things as simple as give a big smile, a warm welcome, a good handshake. Things that just pass along the love of Jesus. You see, our hospitality can also shine through the excellent meals that we have at our church. There are many ways that we can share this hospitality. But I want us to understand that to help God's church, hospitality is one of the things that is crucial in the life of the church. Not just this church, but every church. And I pray that the Lord would help us to be more like Manasseh, overflowing with God's hospitable love. I think about Corey Thomas, who is a girl who grew up here. Many of you know Corey. She is the leader of the hospitality team at the church that she serves at right outside of St. Louis. I know none of you could imagine Corey being the hospitality leader. I'm just kidding. She's real outgoing. She loves everybody. But that's what she does. And John and Joni were telling me, you know, she works at Chick-fil-A, uh, but she don't know how to, she's not really a good cook is what John and Joni said. I don't know. I can't attest to that. But her preacher, her pastor preached on hospitality one Sunday. And she just really felt a tug from the Lord that that was where she was supposed to be. That was where she was supposed to serve. And so you know that Corey has begun opening her home to people in her church. She's begun cooking meals or having meals catered in from Chick-fil-A, whatever the, the, the need may be. But friends, she took on that attitude of Manasseh that she was going to show the hospitable love of Jesus. And I pray that we would do the same as His children. We can help God's church with hospitality in our hearts. But the second thing that I believe we see here, ways that we can help, is to have gratitude for God's goodness. To have gratitude for God's goodness. Not just expect it, not just know that it's going to happen, but instead to have gratitude for it. You see, God wants us to be grateful for all that He's done for us, for all of the goodness that He shows us in our lives but unfortunately, the church in Jerusalem is an example of the way not to be, the way not to look at things. Notice what verse 17 says. We see a flash of gladness in their hearts where Luke said, When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. In that moment, they received them gladly. But we'll see in a few moments that didn't stay, that didn't last. The commentary writer John Phillips again explained this was the only bright spot in the whole story of this visit of, the Paul, to, of Paul to Jerusalem. What was it uh, that made the Jerusalem Christians so glad? Why were they so excited to see it, see him? Was it the money that the Gentile churches had taken up and that he was getting ready to deliver? If so, their appreciation was short-lived. It's not even recorded that they so much as thanked Paul for the gift and for his efforts and for his Gentile friends and for their generosity. All it says is that they greeted him gladly, and then it ended. There doesn't seem to be any real gratitude in their hearts. Paul had traveled hundreds and hundreds of miles to help them. The Gentile churches who they looked down upon had gone and given, even when they couldn't give, a large offering to help the church at Jerusalem. And then Gentile Christians had given sacrificially, again, even when they couldn't afford to give. 
But there was no evidence of the gratitude in their heart from the Jewish believers at Jerusalem. So today, friends, I want to ask us, how grateful are we for God's goodness in our lives? I don't know about you, but I look around. And even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of tribulations, there is the goodness of God that surrounds us all around us. I don't know about you, but I can look at the children that sit on the couch at my house, and I think, God, you are so good. I have three healthy children. I look at my wife, and I say, man, God is so good to give her to me because I am so undeserving and so unworthy. Yes, Amy, I just said that from the pulpit. They're at home watching this morning. Friends, there is goodness all around us. God blesses us with so much, but so often we get so caught up in the negative. We get so caught up in the things that are going on, the trials and the tribulations, that we forget about the goodness. These Christians at the church in Jerusalem were so caught up in their rituals, they were so caught up in their customs, that they couldn't even be grateful for the sacrifice that was made by their Gentile brothers and sisters. I want to share a story with you about a pastor. His name was David Reed. And he told about something that happened when he was a prisoner of war in a Nazi camp during World War II. He said they were going through terrible conditions of hunger. Then one day a German soldier at his post finished eating a sandwich and he threw the crust onto the ground where the prisoners were. Pastor Reed later said, I pounced on it quickly as lightning. We crouched beside a stone and measured the crust into three exactly equal parts, which we consumed like gourmets attacking a perfect filet mignon. It wasn't the last time that I was to reflect how casually we accept the meals that come our way three times a day during peacetime and how weak our prayers of thanks can be. God has blessed us with so much and we need to be more grateful. I know I do and One of the great things about our gratitude, one of the great things that we can do is that we can help our church. We can share that goodness with our church. Our gratitude can help our church in a really big way because it'll motivate us to say good things about our Lord. It'll motivate us when we hear others talking about the goodness of God. It motivates us. Maybe we're stuck in that rut, but we hear others talking about how good God is and We get to looking around and we see the blessings in our life and it motivates us to share good things about the Lord. Pastor Roland Allen was reminded of this truth by a testimony from a longtime missionary. The missionary introduced himself and said, I was a medical missionary for many years in India and I served in a region where there was progressive blindness. People just went blind. It was like they they were born with healthy vision and then all of a sudden people in this area would just go blind. They would lose their sight as they got older. It was a problem that many, many faced. By the grace of the Lord, this missionary was able to develop a surgery that would stop the loss of their vision. So people came to him and he performed the operation on them. They would leave realizing that they had been spared a life of blindness. They realized what he had done for them because of this missionary. But they never really said thank you. They never used that word because it wasn't a phrase that was a part of their language. They didn't know what that word meant. Instead, they spoke a word that meant, I will tell your name. Wherever they went, they would tell the name of the missionary who had cured their blindness. They had received something so wonderful that they eagerly proclaimed it. Now friends, think about that. What did Jesus do for us on the cross? He died for us so that we could have eternal life. So that we would not have to be separated from Jesus eternally. So that we would not have to endure the pain of hell. But friends, so often we get so caught up in the trial and the tribulation that we can't even tell the name of Jesus. But friends, if we live with gratitude in our heart... We'll want to go and to tell the name, even when we don't say thank you. When we tell the name of Jesus, we're helping others. Because they can come to know Him. They can have that same relationship. You see, that kind of gratitude tends to overflow. And someone who finds a way out, their grateful heart will naturally overflow to speak well of the Lord and His church. That's why our gratitude can help our church and why our gratitude can do so much for the Lord.
But the third thing that I believe we can do to help our church is to love the lost. We can show God's love. We can love the lost. Notice what verse 18 and 19 says. It says, On the following day, Paul went, with, went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Notice that there is an amazing partnership here in verse 19. The amazing privilege that God gave Paul to work together with him. And Paul talked about the things that God had done through his ministry. Paul didn't get to do all of these things. He didn't get to go on these three missionary journeys because his name was Paul and he chose to do it. Paul got to do these things because he was chosen of God to go and to be a servant, a bond servant, as he called himself earlier in the book of Acts. That was a partnership. And friends, God, as, with a relationship with Jesus, God has called us the same way that he called Paul. There was this partnership, and we have that same ability to have that partnership. You see, the Apostle Paul did everything he could, and the Lord did the things that only he could do. Paul served and the Lord saved. God wants to give us the same privilege of seeing the hard work through us be shown, to, to, to see the fruit of that. But that won't happen if we don't love the lost. The fuel for the fire in Paul's heart was his love for people who didn't know the Lord. That's made evident because that was the primary crux of his ministry. He went and he shared the gospel with people who didn't know about Jesus. He was so excited about reaching the lost that he, he couldn't stop talking about it. In verse 19, he declared particularly or told in detail or some translation, that, that's what some translations say. The one that I read said he related one by one to them the details which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. You see, the original word there, told in detail, meant one by one, exactly what the word said. In other words, Paul told the whole story. He didn't leave anything out. He gave every explicit detail. I don't know about you, but sometimes I find myself telling stories. And I feel like it's going to be a quick story. And then I realize that I've told every detail and it takes me forever to tell a story. I don't know if you're like that or not. But I find myself doing that, and at the, I, I, an, another thing that I do is I, I will say, to make a long story short, and then I give you all the details of it. I don't know if you've ever noticed that about me, but I do that. And that's exactly what Paul did here. He gave all of the details. He told one by one. John Phillips said that Paul began surely with his first visit to Galatia and told the thrilling story of his three missionary journeys. He told them everything that had happened from when he began in Salamis to where he ended right before he got to Jerusalem. And not just places that he went, but he talked about people because he had seen individuals come to the Lord. Thousands upon thousands of people had been saved they, had wa they were washed in the blood of the Lamb. They were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the church of Christ. And not only the places and the people, but he was able to tell stories of his persecution and his imprisonment. Stories of miracles and mighty movements of the Spirit. Never had these Jerusalem Christians with their narrow interest heard the stories that Paul had shared. Because they had never gone to share the gospel with, with the Gentiles. They had never gone and been imprisoned for sharing the word of the Lord. They didn't know. They didn't experience the same things that Paul had experienced. But I can just imagine Paul sitting down and saying those words that I said to make a long story short. And then he just gives every little detail of the story. But you see, sadly, the church at Jerusalem didn't seem to share Paul's love for the lost Gentiles. A close look at verse 20 confirms the sad truth. Remember, they, they, they began and they said that they, the brothers greeted them quickly. But notice verse 20. It says, And when they heard it, they glorified God. Sounds great. They glorified God. But then we have another and. And notice what it says. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed they are all zealous for the law. Note the word and in verse 20. It is the key to the whole situation. 
Of course they glorified God. Who couldn't glorify God at the mention of thousands upon thousands coming to know the Lord? Who couldn't acknowledge that and glorify the Lord? You'd have to be a rock to not be able to do that. But the second and spoils everything that had happened. It spoiled the gratitude that they had. It spoiled the glorification that had happened at the Lord, with the Lord. It links us to what follows. And what follows is a miserable absorption with rites and rituals, forms and ceremonies, their short-sightedness and exclusiveness. And when we get to the bottom line, we discover that they were really not interested in world evangelism. They really weren't interested in sharing the gospel with the lost. They turned at once from their thrilling story of Paul's missionary adventures and successes to a criticism of his neglect of their petty religious rules. And friends, I'm going to stop there for a second. Because I'm so afraid that we get caught up in the same thing today. We get caught up in our doctrine. We get caught up in our theology that we forget about the gospel of Christ and what it means. We get caught up in the fact that we don't believe the same way that the church down the street believes. We get so caught up in the rites and the rituals and the forms and the the thoughts that we don't really remember that above all, this is what's important. The Word of God prevails. The Word of God is true and it will never fail. My thoughts will fail. Man's thoughts will fail every time. But the Word of the Lord will prevail. Some years ago, Billy Graham was interviewed by Dr. Larry King. Larry King asked Dr. Graham, he said, what's your biggest disappointment in life? Dr. Graham said, without a question, it was when President Kennedy called and asked me to come to the Oval Office. He asked me if I believed in the rapture of the church, and I told him that I did. And Kennedy said, well, Dr. Graham, I want you to come. Or, I'm sorry. He said, as you know, I'm Catholic. Does my church believe in the coming of the Lord? Dr. Graham replied that, yes, they did believe. It is their creed and their catechisms where they show that. President Kennedy said, then... Why don't we ever talk about it? Why don't I ever hear anything from my priest about the coming of the Lord? Kennedy said, Dr. Graham, I want you to come to the Oval Office and talk to me about the rapture. Billy Graham replied, I've got the flu and I've been sick and under the weather. Just give me a couple of days and I'll come. But he never had the opportunity to speak to President Kennedy because a couple of days later, President Kennedy was assassinated. Dr. Graham told Larry King on live television that night that his biggest disappointment in life was that there was a man that was hungry for God's Word and he put him off. Friends, do we have a hunger for the lost world? When I read that story this week, I thought about numerous people in my life where I've put them off because I've been too busy. I've had other agendas And I don't know if they'll die and go to hell because I didn't take the opportunity to share the gospel. Friends, are we hungry for the lost? How many opportunities have we missed? I pray that God would fill us with a great love for the lost so that we can help His church. But the fourth and final thing that I believe God shows us this morning that we can help the church is with patience for other people. And before you stop me and say, wait, we don't pray for patience. We don't ask for patience. I know. I've done it. It's not good. But friends, we must have patience with other people. What a letdown that it must have been for Paul. In that moment, he thought he was going to be received. He thought people were going to be glad that he was there. He had gone so far. He had worked so hard. He had suffered so much. He sacrificed All that he had, only to see the Jerusalem believers blow it off like it was almost nothing. Romans 13, 7 tells us that to give honor to whom honor is due, and if anyone in the church ever deserved honor, it was Paul. 
But the Jerusalem believers treated him with suspicion and disrespect. Look again at verses 20 and 21. It says, And they said to him, You see, brothers, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to their customs. Albert Barnes explained it this way. He reports about Paul's ministry. He reports that they were likely in circulation among all the Jews at Jerusalem. His remarkable conversation, he distinguished zeal. His success among the Gentiles would make him conduct a subject of special interests. Along the way, Paul encouraged many evil-minded men among the Jews who rejected the truth about Jesus Christ. These men came up to Jerusalem from different places where Paul had been and painted him as an enemy of the law of Moses. Friends, naturally, these reports reached the ears of the Jewish Christians. And they were magnified until the Jewish Christians also suspected that Paul was a foe of the Jewish rites and customs. And then again in verse 21, James and all the elders reported that Paul was accused of teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. The original word forsake there is where the word apostasy comes from. So they were accusing Paul of terrible heresy based on nothing but vicious rumors. And John Phillips reminds us that soon afterward, bowing to their narrow-minded and short-sighted suggestions, Paul found himself embroiled with a Jewish mob. He then became a prisoner in the hands of Roman soldiers. But we read of no move on the part of James. James never came forward to speak for him. Or anyone else that came to help him or even to visit him. There was not, it was not their finest hour. And we must be careful about judging them. Which one of us has never had a bad day? Which one of us has never had a bad week or even a bad month? Have you ever been irritable or rude or selfish to anyone? Friends, I had to make a phone call yesterday to somebody that I was rude to in the morning. And I had to call and apologize to them. Because I was not having a good morning, and I don't want to blame it on that. Things were not going right. And I had to call and apologize for being rude. So friends, who are we to judge these people? It was not their finest hour. But thank God for His grace. Thank God that His mercies are new every day. Thank God for the cross of Jesus Christ. And don't be surprised when other Christians disappoint us too. You see, the leader of the Jerusalem church was James, the brother of our Lord and Savior. He wrote the book of James in our Bible. How well do you think that we stack up against James? If James was a nine, what number would we be? If James, the brother of our Lord, was a nine, what number would we be? My point is this, friends. If some of the greatest Christians who have ever lived fell so short, if some of us fall so short, don't be surprised or impatient or super critical when other Christians do too. Some people join a church thinking that everybody there is going to be well behaved, that they're all going to just be pressing on towards the Lord all the time. But friends, we falter, we mess up, and other people get discouraged. They look at us, and sometimes they get discouraged, and sometimes they even quit coming and being a part. They say, I don't need to be down there with that house full of hypocrites. You've heard that excuse before. There's no such thing as a perfect church. And the only perfect person is Jesus Christ. I've said this to many of you. If you decide one day that you get mad and you want to leave here for any reason, and you go to another church and you think it's perfect, don't join it because it'll no longer be perfect. Because friends, I'm not perfect and neither are you. We're going to mess up. We're going to let people down. Paul was patient with the Christians in Jerusalem. They were about ready to persecute him again. And he was patient with them. And God wants us to be patient with other people. How patient was Paul? So patient that he was willing to bend over backwards for the Christians in Jerusalem. 
That's what he did in these verses. Notice what, what he did in verse 23 and 24. It says, Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know there is nothing in what they have, told, have been told about you but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. Friends, Paul didn't owe this to them. He didn't have to go make this sacrifice. He didn't have to go purify himself. But the church leaders told him to, to go through the purification ceremony, along with four other Jewish Christians. Not only did they ask Paul to be purified, but they asked him to pay for the, the other people to do it as well. And it was a very expensive request. Paul had to buy a dozen prime animals for the sacrifices along with other expenses. And in verse 26, that is what he did. Paul took the men and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. There Paul was willing to bend over backwards. He was patient. Even though it was unnecessary, even though it was even unreasonable, that's how patient Paul was with the people. He was willing to turn the other cheek. He was willing to go the extra mile. He was keeping God's priorities in focus. Friends, this morning, Paul was living like Jesus. And that's exactly what the Lord wants us to do. Nothing can help us be like God's church more than that is to love other people and be patient with them and be willing to share the gospel with them at all cost. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we thank you so much for today. And we thank you for Paul, God, and his willingness to go even do things that he didn't have to do. God, for your name's sake, so that your word would be glorified, so that your name would be honored above all else. God, we'll see in the weeks to come that Paul's going to experience great ridicule, great persecution, but he did it for your name's sake. And so, God, this morning, as we think about helping our church and what we can do, God, not just Mount Pisgah Baptist Church, God, but the greater church, your church, your kingdom, God. Lord, we must have hospitality in our hearts. We must serve with the gratitude of your goodness. We must love the lost. And God, we need to have patience with other people. We see this exemplified in the life of Paul, God, and we pray that as we look at that picture, God, that we would have his heart to go and to share with the world. Even in the midst of trial, even in the midst of tribulation, even though we know what's going to happen, we might get told no, we might be rejected. But God, give us boldness to stand and speak anyway. God, help us to have that hospitable heart. Help us to see your goodness all around us. God, give us a love for the lost and God, even though we don't want to pray for patience, God, we pray that you would give us patience for other people because we're going to let one another down. God, I pray that you would continue to give this body of believers patience for me. God, as I fail every day. But Lord, it's because of your grace and your mercy that I get back up and I run again. So God, help us. Help us, God, as we help your church go and to strengthen relationships with you, with the world, and with your church, God. Help us to be a light in this community, a city on a hill, God, set aside for your glory. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I've never experienced the goodness of God. I've never experienced a relationship with Jesus. Friend, today is the day that you could know him. Friend, apart from a relationship with Jesus, we will spend eternity in hell. James tells us that life is like a vapor. We're not promised tomorrow. So friend, don't let that happen to you. If today is the day, 
If God is knocking at the door of your heart, come today, accept Him. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I need to bind with this body of believers in the mission and the work that they're doing for, Mount, for, for this community. We'd love to have you. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I haven't been living with that hospitable heart. I haven't been living thinking about the goodness of God. I haven't been loving the lost and having patience with other people. But I know that God can set me straight and help me. If that's you today, these altars will be open. I'll be at the front if you need to talk. Don't walk out these doors today without doing business with the Lord. We're going to sing one more song, hymn of invitation. Living for Jesus. Friend, I hope you can make that your prayer today, that everything we do, we do it for Jesus. God, thank you for allowing us to serve you. God, thank you for allowing us to study your word and to worship you this morning. It's in your gracious and loving heavenly name we pray today. Amen.